Hello. <coughs> Children, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, on the seven nine. Okay. <coughs> Uh, let us begin. We were talking on uh, right understanding and uh, we came to right mindfulness. And right mindfulness, we have four talks on right mindfulness. Today is number five. Now this is very, very important for us to remember. Mindfulness is uh, important because uh, everything uh, can be done very uh, clearly and uh, skillfully and we remember what we learn and how we talk, what happened in our mind All this becomes very clear when we practice mindfulness. Mindfulness uh, traditionally divided into four categories. Four categories. One is mindfulness of the body. Second, mindfulness of feelings. Third, mindfulness of the mind itself. Fourth, is mindfulness of mind objects, mind objects. Now, when we discuss mindfulness, don't ask where the mind is. <coughs> don't ask where the mind is. It doesn't matter where the mind is, we know that we think. It doesn't matter where the mind is, but we know that we think. When we train mindfulness, therefore, even though there are four categories of mindfulness practice all boil down to one, that is training our mind. From all these things we train our mind. Now let us begin with the mindfulness of the body. We all have bodies. We, under, we, try, we can understand the body in several ways, different levels. At this level, we understand the body through our breathing. We 
we all breathe. When we breathe mindfully, we pay attention to our breath. Pay attention to our breath. And we <coughs> become aware of inhaling as inhaling. Exhaling as exhaling. Now we don't use words. We don't use without using words. We simply pay attention to our breath. So when we breathe in, we pay attention to our breath. And then we know sometimes our breath is long. Sometimes it is short. Now we don't have to think of it. You just, for instance, this very moment, close your eyes and pay attention to your breath. Now close your eyes. Close eyes. You yep. close eyes. Everybody close eyes. And pay attention to don't move. Stay still, quiet, and pay attention to your breath. and breathe in and out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Then you can notice while breathing in, breathing out, you feel your breath. You feel your breath. There is no other way to know the breath. You feel it. When you feel the breath, you feel when you take a long breath, you feel that breath is long. When you breathe out, that out breath also is long. When you breathe in long, you know this breath is long, inhaling is long. When you exhale, that exhaling breath also is long. But it is not very long. It is just long enough to be noticed. And it is, in fact, breathe, you breathe naturally now, breathe naturally, normally, as you breathe every moment. As you keep breathing like this for a while, you take, without much effort, you take a long breath. 
and then exhale long. When you take a long breath, your exhaling also is long. What happened in the previous to the previous breathing? Previously it was relatively short. Now it is relatively long. And you just become aware of it. Don't say anything in words. When you do this, your feeling of long inhaling, your feeling of short inhaling, feeling of long exhaling, feeling of short exhaling, you notice only through feelings. Now, <clears throat> this is how we begin. But don't fall asleep. Stay totally awake because sometimes perhaps you may open your eyes now. Open your eyes now. Because if I let you keep your eyes closed, you might fall asleep. And what <laughs> I'm trying to tell you may not go through your mind, not go, go into your mind. And therefore, this is how we begin. And then, you know, the breath is very, very important. It is, it doesn't belong to a religion. It doesn't belong to a country. It is very natural air. Outside we breathe in. And this outside air and inside air that we breathe in are the same. There's no difference. But when we breathe in, we condition our body. <coughs> How we condition our body? You know, all kind of conditions are there. Hair conditioner. You, you know hair conditioners? Yes, very well. <laughs> and skin conditioners. You know skin conditioners? Yes. You know nail conditioners? You know all this. Nail conditioner, polished nails. You polish your eyes. These are conditioning to make you look different. So, the breath also is kind of conditioners. Conditioner. I bet, can you tell me how breath condition the body? Okay, I tell you how breath condition the body. Breath brings oxygen into our lungs. And that oxygen charge our red blood cells with that have no oxygen. And then it goes to the heart. Heart pumps. When the heart beat with fresh blood cells with oxygen, that blood cells go all over our body with fresh oxygen. 
new oxygen and charge all the people say we have 56 trillion cells in our body 56 trillion body trillion cells and oxygen charges all these cells otherwise cells will die and then every time we breathe in we bring oxygen from outside from the air and charge blood cells what you call hemoglobins that don't have oxygen this body consumes so much oxygen every cell lives by oxygen without oxygen cells will die we will die so we bring oxygen into our lungs charge blood cells that don't have oxygen and then that blood with oxygen goes to heart then heart pumps and that oxygen rich blood cells go around the body and oxygen depleted blood cells come back to heart again when the heart beat again that oxygen depleted blood cell goes to the lungs and then we breathe in charge them with oxygen and then that blood cells goes go back to the lungs I and mean, heart and heart pumps and this way this breath conditions our body breath conditions our body through bringing blood what you call oxygen into the body this is very scientific way of conditioning the body through the breathing and therefore the breath is called body conditioner not only that we have to breathe again and again and again and again and again from the moment we were born till we die we breathe why have why we have to breathe so many times why do we have to breathe so many times because breath doesn't stay fixed in one place breath is coming and going breath comes into lungs and goes out of lungs and that is what we call change or impermanence now remember this word impermanence breath is impermanence impermanent breath is impermanent that is why we have to breathe so many times we don't actually count we have not counted somebody somebody might have counted how many times we breathe a day if you count how many times you breathe in a minute then you can know how many times you breathe in an hour and then how many times you breathe in 24 hours you can easily calculate how many times you breathe in an hour in, in a minute how many times you breathe in an hour how many times you breathe in 24 hours why we have to breathe so many times 
because breath is not imp- not permanent. As breath is not permanent, we also know the oxygen we breathe in also not permanent. This is very important thing to remember. Oxygen we breathe in, we get from the air, is not permanent. So we have to breathe again and again and again and again to fill our lungs with oxygen and refresh or charge our blood cells with oxygen, send them round the, round the body to keep the body alive. So breath keeps us alive. Okay? Breath keeps us alive. You know these days uh, we people suffering from COVID-19 they die of lack of oxygen. They are hooked up to oxygen machines. Oxygen machines because oxygen is the most important thing in our life. We can stay without drinking for an hour or two. We can stay without eating for several hours. But we can stay even two minutes without breath. And yet breath is so impermanent. We have to remember, in mindfulness, I, I said all these things for us to understand what we do in mindfulness practice. In mindfulness practice, we under, try to understand this nature of our life. Nature of our life. Our life is changing, changing, changing all the time. We change. You all remember when you were little, now you are big. Because we changed. So, in the the mindfulness is divided into four categories. First category is mindfulness of the body. And we see how body changes. Body changes. And there is this this a very big subject. I simply want to give you a very brief outline. Similarly, our feelings change. You know, one moment we have very pleasant feeling, beautiful feeling, happy feeling, and next moment or sometimes later, we don't have that happy feelings. We have we, are, we will have not so happy feelings. We have a mood change and then our feelings change. And also we see things, hear things, smell things, taste things, touch things and think various things. They also change. They always change. So in mindfulness practice, we f- one thing we always notice is the changes. If we do, if there is no change, nothing can we learn. Because when we learn something new, we improve. If there is no, if nothing changes, 
we neither can learn nor can we improve. So, changes are very important. Then, uh, I mentioned our, uh, we have to be mindful of uh, what is happening in our mind. That means when we get angry, when we get angry, where do we feel anger? In the in the mind, not in the body. Right? When we feel, when we get angry, we feel the anger in our mind. When we are mindful, as soon as anger arises, we become aware of it, we become mindful of it, and we see anger does not make us happy. Okay? Anger does not make us happy. Anger may make us very, very unhappy. So with mindfulness, we see that. We want to see how anger arises, how it makes us unhappy. If you do the same thing again and again and again, you will be very, very angry person. If you get angry very often and keep repeating it again and again, then you will be a very angry person. Angry person is so unhappy. People don't like to associate with angry person. So with mindfulness we see this. With mindfulness we see this. And therefore we try not to let anger arise in our mind. We practice patience and we see anger is hurting us. Therefore, we do not want to develop anger in us. Or when we are too much greedy, when we are greedy, we are unhappy. Greed doesn't make us happy. Greedy person always is very unhappy. When we train ourselves to be mindful, we see the pain that we have when we are greedy. So we try not to let greed possess our mind. We do not let greed possess our mind or greed dominate our life. We do not want anger dominate our life. We do not want hatred dominate our life. We rather want happy, peaceful life. When anger is there, we cannot be friendly with others. And we try, therefore, not to develop anger. 
Rather, we develop friendliness. We call it metta. Metta. We practice metta rather than anger or hatred. So we can see the benefit of practicing metta and the danger of practicing anger. That we can see with mindfulness. So, <coughs> children, every Sunday at this time, I like to talk f- for half an hour on a topic like this, especially now we are uh, talking on mindfulness. I hope you have some idea of what mindfulness is <coughs> and from what you have learned now, you can ask me questions. This has to be a sort of uh, uh, turn into a discussion, a dialogue, so you may ask me questions right now, then we can, others also can join, and then we can have a good discussion. Okay? Who likes to start? Okay? Anybody? Uh, I can see you have any question? I have a question. Yeah, what is that? Um, this doesn't, it, it kind of relates to this to topic, but, um, so I've heard from like people that uh, when you're studying, uh, I'm pretty sure this question was asked before in one of the previous sessions, but I didn't really understand the answer to it. Um, so when you're studying, um, some people say like listening to music is a good, uh, like a good thing. It helps you, um, focus. So what's your opinion on this? When you listen to music, you can focus your mind on music? Uh, On your studies. When you listen to music, you can focus your mind on your studies? Yes. Can you gain uh, concentration? Uh, Yes. And also you remember what you study? Is it Is it easy for people to listen to music and study at the same time and remember uh, what they study? And uh, I think if we uh, clean the mind, what the mindfulness does is we clean the mind. When we clean the mind, then we will not have stress in our mind. You know, when you listen to music and study, your uh, understanding may not be very deep. If you be, become mindful at that time when you study, Uh, you can focus very well and uh, your mind will be uh, very relaxed. Not too many things 
going into the mind at the same time. When we put so many things at the same time, mind gets stress. You f you feel stress, and then you will have a very difficult time to deal with other regular things. But if you uh, practice mindfulness and clean the mind and study, the mind does not have so much stress. I think therefore for this reason, practice <coughs> listening to music and so forth, uh, you may do for calming, relaxing and so forth any other time. At the same time, practicing mindfulness is uh, far better to clean the mind and reduce the stress. <coughs> there are <coughs> very learned people who have developed uh, meditation or teach meditation, use meditation, practice meditation, especially Vipassana meditation, to reduce stress. Music has been going on in the world for a long, for long time, but it does not reduce the stress. Temporarily it may, but in the long run, to reduce stress, one must practice meditation. That's, uh, that has been proven psychologically, scientifically proven mindfulness is a better way of reducing our stress. Okay, with that? I have a question. Yes. So when you practice metta meditation, you like wish for the people to be happy and successful and so on. So when you do that, how can you like actually know that these people will uh, attain nibbana? These people will um, like be successful, be happy, well, peaceful. How do we really know that that will happen? Because isn't it really dependent on the person you're doing metta for? Okay, this is Anudhi. Yes. Oh, oh Anudhi, okay. It's a good question, Anudhi. When you practice uh, metta, honestly, we practice metta for ourselves. We want to keep our mind clean. We want to fill our mind with metta. We really don't know whether other people receive metta or not. By wishing, Say, uh, for instance, you say, I hate so-and-so, I hate so-and-so, I say so-and-so. That, per that so-and-so does not know what you are doing. That person is not even within your sight. That person may be somewhere else. But when you repeat the word or thought in your mind, I hate, I hate, I hate, what will happen is you are full of hatred. You are full of hatred, not the other person. You don't know what happened to the other person. Similarly, when you practice metta, it is your mind that is filled with metta. And you feel uh, calm, relaxed, and peaceful. You know, only the one who practices metta can have the benefit of metta. Like when you eat, you feel the taste and you get your stomach full and you satisfy your hunger. You cannot eat for somebody else. It is exactly like that. If you practice metta, you feel peaceful, you will benefit. There are 11 benefits of practicing metta. Uh, let me, since you asked me the question, let me mention these 11 benefits. I don't know whether I told you earlier, 
but let me mention them now. Number one is that you can sleep well. You can sleep well. If you practice metta, you can sleep well. And, of course, people who are very tired coming after work and this and that, uh, young people and so they can sleep well. But well, sleeping well doesn't mean just you are just going into bed and fall asleep like a rock and get up next morning and grouchy, grumpy and, uh, and so forth. When you sleep well, you are really, mind is in real rest. And therefore, in the sleep, you will not have nightmares, number two. You will not have nightmares. Number three, you get up well. When you get up well, you feel so fresh. You don't grouch, you don't grump, you don't have... Uh, uh, sort of uh, bad mood, you are very like, very much like a flower, opening, fresh, clean in the morning. So three benefits. Sleeping well, not having bad dreams, nightmares, and getting up very well. Then you will your fear, you will be pleasing to others, number four. Number four is you will be pleasing to others. That means others like to see you because your pleasant, your, your appearance is very pleasant. Then you, number five, you will be a very, you will be Please, pleasing to non-human beings. Non-human beings like animals, divine beings, and so forth. For instance, when you practice metta, you can talk to your dog or cat or uh, even plants with a very relaxed state of mind. You have this benefit. Then you will be protected by divine beings. That's number six. Protected by divine beings. Uh, divine beings like to see people full of metta. Because you practice metta without any condition. And this also is called unconditional love. You don't practice metta because somebody else does some favor to you. But you practice metta irrespective of what the other person is, what the world, how the world is. world has 7.8 billion people. They are all different types. And uh, we even don't know them. But when you practice metta, without any condition, even divine beings love you, respect you, protect you. And uh, because you don't have anger in, in you, when you practice metta. And then you will not be affected by greed, hatred, and delusion. They are called fire, poison, and weapon. Fire, fire of anger, fire of hatred, fire of delusion. You will not be affected. Or oh, fire, greed, hatred, and delusion also is called poison. Your mind will not be affected by poison, poison of greed, poison of hatred, poison of delusion. 
your mind will not be affected by weapons. What is the weapon? Weapon of greed, weapon of hatred, weapon of delusion. These are very, very negative mental states. They will not affect your mind. You are very, very peaceful. Then, uh, when you, number nine, when you practice metta, you gain concentration very easily, very quickly. Because the mind is very clean and pure. You practice metta without any ulterior motive, just for the sake of practicing. Number ten, as a result of all these things, when you, if you do not attain uh, nirvana or uh, other level of enlightenment like uh, stream entry and so forth, if you don't attain any of them, you will be reborn in Brahma realm. That is the number 10. Number 11. So these are the 11 benefits of practicing metta. You will have all of them. And therefore, we say for, for the sake of uh, wishing, we say may all beings be well, happy and peaceful and so forth. We say that. We say that in order to get rid of our greed, our hatred, our delusion from our mind. Get rid of them from our mind. In order to clean our mind, we say, may all beings be well, happy and peaceful. Whether they become well, happy and peaceful, we don't know. We don't know. But it is, but we know for sure that our mind becomes well, happy and peaceful. Our mind. Okay, Anudhi? Thank you, Bhanteji. Very good, very good. And any other question? Bhante, I have a question. What is that? Uh, if you clean your mind, how does it help you concentrate? I think that is very good, uh, Anaya, right? Yeah. yeah. Also very good mind, very good question. When you clean your mind, how you gain concentration? Because uh, when we practice meditation, there are obstacles, obstacles. We call them hindrances that blocks our concentration. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, greed. Greed is one hindrance. Anger is another hindrance. Sleepiness and drowsiness is another hindrance. Restlessness and worry is another hindrance. And doubt is hindrance. Our mind, if the mind is cluttered with these hindrances, we cannot gain concentration. So, when we clean the mind of all these things, it is very easy for the mind to gain concentration. That's how we gain concentration. I, I want to talk more about these things but I don't know your level of understanding all this, but let us take it easy and gradually we go into these areas. Uh, at this very beginning state, uh, we uh, try to learn uh, what you call easy stuff, easy part, and then later on I go, we can go into very deep levels of meditation. 
but uh, this level at this level uh, we discuss uh, very simple uh, steps of meditation yes any other question yes i have a yes. um, question um i Ma. I could only um, write eight of them. Could you repeat like all the loan benefits of metta again, please? Okay, very good. Uh, sleeping well, getting up well. Two, three is uh, not having nightmares. Uh, Here we are we are we become pleasing to others number four and we become pleasing to uh, uh, non human beings five uh, and divine beings protect us six. And our face becomes very pleasing, seven. And uh, we will not be affected by fire, poison, and weapon. Three. Then how many? Altogether, I have nine. Or do you got nine? I have. You can sleep very well. Um, you will not have nightmares. You will get up very well, happy and peaceful. You will be pleasing to others. You will be pleasing to non-living things. Protected from divine beings. Your mind will not be affected by greed, hatred, or delusion. You gain concentration very quickly, and your face is pleasing. Okay, if you don't at again higher level of uh, practice, and doesn't don't attain stream entry and so forth, you will be reborn in Brahma realm, and you pass away without confusion. You pass away without any confusion. That also is a very important benefit. So the yeah. number ten is that if you don't attain um, nibbana, then you go to Brahmaram. Brahmaram, right? Yeah. Okay. And then the eleventh one is that you pass away with no confusion. Without no, without any confusion. Very true. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You are Mah Mahel. Maheli. Yes, Mahel. Okay. Okay. Very good question. Anybody else has anything else? It's <coughs> you know, it's a, a practicing metta is so important that suppose there are you plant true two trees, you plant two plants, uh, side by side, maybe about ten feet apart, and you put, you water it, them every day at the same time, you fertilize them, you have uh, enough sunlight to them, and uh, uh, you put uh, nitrogen or whatever and necessary for the plants, you treat them all equally. But 
you talk to one plant in a very rough, harsh, angry way every day. And you talk to another plant, the other plant, softly, gently, kindly, then you will see the one that you spoke to roughly will not grow very well, will not uh, produce very good product, produce. And the other plant that you talk very gently, kindly, softly, will grow very well. You have, uh, Mahali, you have another question? Yes? Yeah, so one of the learned benefits of Mitta is that you will be pleasing to non-living um, non, non Non-human beings. Oh yeah, non-human beings. Yeah. Human. Like animals, cats yeah. and dogs and so forth, yes. Like, how do they know that you're pleasing? Because they don't ah. know that you're doing metta. They don't know that you are practicing metta, but they know when you get close to them, your body vibration, your body vibration is very peaceful vibration. When you are angry, the vibration is very rough. And these animals have a very, very sharp sensitivity, sensitivity. And therefore they can sense uh, your anger or your loving friendliness, metta. I have okay. seen this very well, very clearly, yeah. <clears throat> You're welcome. Okay. Anybody has any other question? <coughs> okay. I think Anudi asked a question. And Mahali asked a question, and uh, Anaya uh, asked a question, and who else? Uh, Vidat asked a question, and who else? Any of you can ask questions. Asking question is very important. That is how we learn when you ask question. Not only you learn, others learn. Even I learn from your questions. So, and also I must tell you, asking question is, uh, yes, one more question, yes. Heidi? Um, I've heard of the word Brahmadanda, but I like barely know about it. Like, is it like a bad place or a good place? What Brahmadanda? Yeah. Brahmadanda? No, like the I, I forgot how to say. It. Maybe, maybe word word is right. Brahmadanda is correct word. Yeah. If you have heard that, you ask you are you are using right word. Brahmadanda. Mahali is uh, given to uh, uh, monks, given to monks who are uh, who are most difficult to discipline, most difficult to discipline. I give you one example. There was a monk, uh, you know, Channa, in the Buddha's life story, Channa. Channa was the Buddha's driver. 
Siddhartha Gautama's driver. It was Channa who went on with Prince Siddhartha on the horse's back when Kantaka was, uh, Buddha was, Siddhartha Gautama uh, left home uh, on the Kantaka's back. Channa was his, uh, what do you call, uh, jockey, so to say. When Buddha attained enlightenment, Channa also became a monk. But Channa was very arrogant. He would not listen to anybody. When somebody says, somebody gives him an advice, he would say, who are you? I am the one who helped Siddhartha to attain enlightenment. I am the one who drove the horse. And therefore, I have a right to be like as, uh, as I am. So then Buddha called him and said, Channa, don't do that. The stubbornness is not the right thing in this dispensation, this Dhamma practice. Stubbornness always blocks your progress. You cannot learn. Try to be obedient, simple, humble, gentle, and so forth. Even then he would not listen. Even he listened, he did not listen even to the Buddha. When the Buddha was going to pass away, <coughs> Venerable Ananda Buddha's personal attendant, asked the Buddha, Venerable Sir, now we are going to pass away. This Channa is very stubborn. Nobody can control him. Very wild. Uh, what shall we do to him? Then Buddha said, give him Brahmadanda. What is the Brahmadanda? Don't talk, don't talk to him. Don't associate with him. Boycott him. Leave him alone. So, with this advice, Buddha passed away. Then, when the Ananda wanted to announce the Buddha's Brahmadanda to Channa. So Venerable Ananda went with another monk because um, Channa was very wild, he can even physically attack. So Venerable Ananda went with another monk to Channa and said, Channa, uh, I have two announcements to make. One, that our Buddha passed away. As soon as he said that the Buddha passed away, Channa was so grieved, so grief-stricken, so sad. He could not believe his eyes, his ears. He felt the whole world is dark because his entire courage, his strength was the Buddha and that he passed away. He almost passed out. Then Venerable Ananda said, Venerable Channa, not only that, I have to make you make another announcement, second announcement. Second announcement is that Buddha asked us to boycott you, not to associate with you, not to talk to you. You don't come to our meetings. You, we leave you alone. Then he really fainted, collapsed, fell on the ground. Then Ananda sprinkled water and touched his face and so forth. He woke him up. Then, that time onward, Channa was very, very obedient, gentle monk. In order to make him that humble and simple and obedient, Buddha gave this Brahmadanda. Where, where, where did you learn that Brahmadanda? Well, I've heard of it like a couple times in like in like books, but like I don't know really about it. It doesn't matter where you learn it, Miley. That is uh, the word you use is correct. 
the punishment is this. That is the meaning of Brahma Danda. Danda means punishment. Brahma Danda, Brahma Danda means highest punishment, almost like capital punishment. <coughs> Brahma means highest capital punishment. Okay. okay, very good. Thank you. So you all ask good questions and the, we want to close this session and uh, see you next week. Okay, bye. Thank you, Vandu. You are welcome. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.